Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Midwest Dream Park Collection for our monthly trip talk. Um, if you haven't been to our museum before, we appreciate you coming, and I would invite you to go look on our display floor after our trip talk this morning. We just put out a number of beautiful new cars on the display floor, including a 1930 Cadillac V16, a 1969 Honda GTX, a 56 Chevy 150, a 1930 Chrysler, a 1964 Shelby Cobra FIA replica, and a 1970 Cuda, along with a lot of other gorgeous cars out there. So make sure you wander around and check them out after the, after their tread talk today. We are so honored today to have with us Dan Minnick. Uh, Dan is an instructor of... Operations and Supply Chain. Operations and Supply Chain. I don't want you to remember that. <laughs> part of his administration at K-State. Uh, Dan has uh, been with our museum since we opened up as a volunteer. He's on our Collections Advisory Board, which meets monthly to discuss future acquisitions for the museum. His wife is Sherry, who manages all of our events here. You've met Sherry this morning at the Donuts, and, and she just all of the organization for the events. Chris Gertie is our Executive Director back here in the back of the room. So anyway, I'm so glad to have you all here today with us. And, and Dan's going to this morning talk about the history of Kansas license plates. And this is kind of special to us. Uh, our original first volunteer here at the museum, um, Larry Shaw, was going to do this presentation and unfortunately uh, passed away before we got the chance to do it. So Dan uh, found the notes and is going to try to follow up with what Larry was put together. So uh, uh, Dan learned a lot of this stuff as he went along. So, but uh, we're going to learn a lot about it today. And so without further ado, let's give Dan a warm welcome. Thanks, Doug. So like Doug said, uh, Larry started this, I don't know how long ago, but um, he had this vision to do this presentation. And so this is really dedicated to him. And we've got several license plates scattered around. You can look at afterwards. Some are from uh, Doug uh, in the museum here. Some others are thanks to Eric Artzer. And then I had a small collection. I had added a few. And then I've also got Larry's notebook of notes. And Larry was, if you knew anything about Larry and his note taking, he was meticulous in um, doing handwritten notes. He wasn't computer savvy. Everything was handwritten, but we have his notebook and I started with that and kind of filled in some things that Larry started. So this is dedicated to him. So interesting, and I learned a lot doing this, um, things I had no clue about. So France invented the first license plate, 1893. Um, the auto industry in the late 1800s, France dominated. And I didn't really know that. You know, I thought oh, I knew quite a bit about early auto history, but um, France was the largest producer of automobiles up until 1907. And even they held the, you know, the largest um, auto producing nation until World War I in Europe. Um, but France, started um, with a license plate 1893 Netherlands followed Germany followed right soon after that um, and I'm my French is terrible so I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce what French people call license plates but the second one has to do with the Department of Mines is the department that issued license plates originally in France and so some people still call them plaques mineralogique um, which means mining plate, which is a weird, that's a weird thing. So anyway, it's because the Department of Mines is the one who issued license plates early on. Anyway, weird random trivia. So in the US though, New York was the first state to require license plates in 1901. And the governor at the time signed a bill requiring owners of vehicles to register um, with the state. Now. What they did in New York and plates were furnished by the vehicle owner. You kind of created your own plate and generally it was out of a piece of leather. I mean it could be a board, it could be anything, but you had to have your initials on there, which was interesting. You put um, whatever your initials were and you generally got house number uh, numbers and you tacked them on whatever piece of leather or wood and put them on your vehicle. And within a week, 17 people had already applied. A guy named George F. Chamberlain was the first person in the US to have a license plate. Um, that's his claim to fame. Um, by September that year, 715 people. And then beginning of April, 1,566. 
and it just um, went from there. So at, at some point you think about, okay, you have your initials on this plate. How many people have the same initials? Probably quite a few. And so they're rethinking, okay, this isn't going to work. Let's assign everybody a number. So the state of New York assigned everybody a number and you had to put that number on your plate then. Still furnishing your own plate, whatever you could conjure up. Again, leather, wood, metal. Massachusetts was the first state to actually issue state-issued plates. And <clears throat> uh, Henry Higginson, who was a wealthy guy, um, founder of the Boston Symphony, he um, wrote this petition complaining about you know, vehicles going 15 miles an hour by my place and we need to stop this chaos and keep track of all these people. And if you've read as a kid the book Wind in the Willows, um, Mr. Toad and his car driving around causing, you know, creating ruckus and things, that was kind of the, you know, um, climate at the time. People kind of thought of, you know, Mr. Toad represented, it's the bourgeois that, you know, they've got all their cars and they're just you know, not caring what, you know, happens to the rest of the public. They're just driving around like mad and we need to keep track of those people. So anyway, Massachusetts um, created this act, um, created a department. We're going to create uh, license plates and a guy named Frederick Tudor got the first plate in the state of Massachusetts. This is the first state issued plate in the U.S. Registration number one, a descendant of him still gets registration number one in Massachusetts. So um, some grandson, great grandson, granddaughter has registration number one still to this day. You know, when they go get their plates, they've got number one. So interesting thing. So who issues plates now? So every state in the US, plates are issued by the state. Okay, some other countries, it's a little different. But in the U.S., uh, we kind of assign that as a state, um, state uh, law or state, you know, state-controlled department. The U.S. government does issue some plates, and here's just a few examples that you've probably seen: um, Department of Agriculture with an A, uh, GSA uh, generally has the G, Department of Homeland Security, and so government plates. You know, if you're a federal federal vehicle. Um, you get a government plate. They also do issue some for you know dip foreign diplomats and those kind of things. Um, some indi indigenous Native American groups also issue plates, but generally those are kind of managed in the state they're in. Okay. So <clears throat> annually, um, it became that states started you know keeping track of registrations every year, and almost all states now you know registrations are on an annual basis. Some states are um, staggered, and we'll get to how Kansas did that, but it, it generally varies from state to state. And numbering systems in states are different. Every state has their own unique kind of pattern. Some have alphanumeric, some have counties, some have groupings. It, it just depends. And um, generally, colors change by year unless a state is issuing you know, the decals, which Kansas does now. So in Kansas, um, in 1904, um, as early as 1904 at least, different cities started issuing registrations. And here's just a couple examples. Um, these are leather, uh, Wakini, number seven, uh, Cottonwood Falls, CWF 113. And again, you can tell, I mean, they're house numbers, you know, riveted or screwed on to a piece of leather, and you furnished your own again and did that. Now, some cities started issuing their own plates, and some of the early ones are porcelain. This one from Ottawa is porcelain. This one from Wichita is porcelain. And the museum actually has a porcelain plate on the Maxwell, which is currently not on display, but we've had that uh, Maxwell out on the floor, and it has a porcelain Wichita plate. This Manhattan plate is metal, um, Manhattan, Kansas. Um, and KAS was typically the um, the uh, early abbreviation for Kansas in a lot of in a lot of cities. Kansas ranks fifth in the number of porcelain plates back in the early aughts and teens. Um, 
most of those um, uh, porcelain plates were from the southeast part of the state. Um, and I don't know if porcelain was more plentiful down there or what, um, but um, most of those early plates, a lot of more porcelain. 1913, Kansas kind of got on the bad wagon as um, we're issuing state-issued plates. Early, early plates um, did not have the year on it. And here's just a couple random years. We've got a few early ones on the table, I think, in the back over on the side there. Every year they would change color and they would move like the KAN around. This, they did this for a couple years, kind of interesting design, um, the interlocked KAN. But, um, and the number is just a numerical number. Um, so that, that con uh, continued up until 1920. Single plate for the year, for the rear of the car, is what Kansas did. 1921, um, kind of a rethinking of how we do plates. Um, Kansas is spelled out for the first time in 29, um, but they did a hyphen or comma, or hyphen instead of a comma um, for the numerical. And, um, they put the year on the plate, you know, so rather than just, you know, changing the color and moving can KAN around, they actually part started putting the year on. So you could tell, you know, whether that was a current plate or not by reading the year. Okay. 1930, a, another rethinking of numbering system in the state of Kansas. What they did was they came up with a county numbering system, and this was used all the way up until 1950. They assigned every county a number, and they used the 1930 census, and the largest county was number one, Wyandotte, and they arranged them numerically by population. So Wyandotte was one, and then Greeley, way out in western Kansas, was 105. Riley was number 30. Riley was kind of a backwater county in 1930. Um, lots of counties, when I looked at that, I've got the list here, I'll pull it up, but um, lots of counties were a far larger population than Riley, that, that surprises me. Um, the sizes of the plates kind of varied. They didn't have a consistent size, and you can kind of see they went from kind of a almost what we have today to kind of a longer plate in various years and then back. Trucks would have a T prefix. Um, I've got, here's a 41 plate with a T in front of it, in front of the county. I don't know what 93, what county that is. 1930, they also issued double plates, front and rear. And that continued quite a few years. Um, and I've got a set of, I think it's 34 or 31 back there front and rear plates. One of them has some leather straps on, so they probably strapped it on a bumper or something. So here's a list of those counties. So Riley's number 30. Um, if you look at these counties, a lot of these are in the southeast part of the state. And I didn't realize southeast part of the state was so population heavy back then. Um, Crawford is southeast, Montgomery, Cherokee, Labette, um, Bourbon, those are all down the southeast part of the state. Um, even Dickinson, which is Abilene, just over here, was kind of way ahead of, of Riley County in population. So here, here's kind of why they did that. You think that's kind of an odd numbering system. But if you look at this, Wyandotte County, what it does is it lets you have more numbers for the larger county. Greeley, small county, you don't need as many registration numbers. So it was kind of a logical, how do we get you know, the amount of numbers on there? So that's what they did. World War II, um, several states did lots of different things in World War II. Um, I've got a 42 one, here's another, here's a real example, a little crusty, but they had sunflowers on the, um, on the bottom corners um, in 42. In 43, metal shortages. They issued a zinc tab, and you can see there, to put on for the 43 registration. And then 44, they issued a plate, and my apologies to this example, it's pretty crusty. This is a 44 plate. They shrunk the size of the plate in 44 and 45 and only issued a rear plate 
to save metal. Okay? Um, I had this in my collection and I always wondered why is that small? I had just assumed it was a motorcycle plate or something until I started reading going, oh, they shrunk the size of the plate in 44 and 40, 45. Um, there's a little better examples there. Some other states, this is actually um, from Eric Artzer's collection. This is a 1942, a little rusty, California registration tab and it goes all the way across the top or maybe the bottom um, as a, a way to save metal and not issue a full plate again. So, um, 46, back to regular size again, five and a half by 12 and back to front and rear plates. Here's another truck with the T for County 64 um, and that continued up until 48. 49, for some reason, and I could not figure out why, 49, the front plate was dropped. And then 50, they went back to a front plate again. So there's just that one year in there where we only had a rear. But 49 and 50, they were unpainted aluminum. And they just had um, either green or black. Um, black on 49 and green, it's hard to tell there. But um, green letters on just unpainted aluminum in 49 and 50. 51, um, again, some, some changes. Uh, they cut out, and here's a 53 one with a tab, cut off the corner. I don't know if you've ever seen these with, they cut off the corner to represent size of the state, or shape of the state. And they went to the two letter, two letter county codes that we know today. Um, dropped the numerical, you know, one through 105s and went to JW for Jewel, SG for Sedgwick, DK for Dickinson, RL for Riley. And they went back to steel rather than the aluminum that they were the past two years. And Korean War hits. And so we've got another metal shortage, trying to conserve metal. So they issued tabs for 52 and 53 as well, affixed to the top right. And the museum had this in a collection Doug got. And I said, what is this? And I looked it up. You got an L if you lost your plate. So it doesn't stand for loser, although maybe it does. I don't know. Um, yeah, because normally 52 and 53 would have had the tabs. This is a 52 plate, and they gave you a big L if you lost your plate, saying, hey, you lost your plate, kind of, I guess, to signify to everyone else you were kind of an irresponsible, I don't know, anyway. I thought that was interesting. And I guess those plates are actually kind of rare, the L plates for 52. And, and I don't know how many years they did the L plates for lost plates. 1956, this is big changes nationally for, for plates. Um, Department of Transportation and the AMA, the automobile makers, manufacturers said, you, you states are all doing all kinds of crazy things with license plates. If we're gonna make cars, we want a standard size so we can design a car that doesn't have to accommodate all kinds of you know, crazy sizes. And so six by 12, a ratio of one to two, um, is the standard now for all plates in the US. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, Kansas complies with this and they think about you know, that ratio, six by 12, is the same ratio as the size of our state. Our state's the only state that actually fits a one by two ratio, 200 miles by 400 miles. and so kind of like the early plates where we had the cutoff corner, they actually stamp in the shape of the state. Um, the wheat state is put on the bottom as kind of a slogan. That continues up through 59. And then in 60 and 61, the centennial state, um, our hundredth year as a state, um, was put on the 60 and the 61 plates as a slogan. Front plates only, or rear plates only, okay? Um, no more, no more front plates. So 56, um, they dropped the front plate requirement. You know, up until now, we pretty much had both front and rear, and a lot of states still have um, front and rear plates. 65, they launched Midway USA from 65 to 70 as a um, as a slogan on the bottom of the plate. Plates changed color every year. And then in 1971, um, they, 
the license plate, um, Department of Revenue says we need to stagger registration. You know, up until now, everybody's plates expired at the end of the year. And I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember, everybody went to, and you had 30 days to the end of January to renew your plates. So January was insanity at the courthouses. I mean, it was a line of people, everybody renewing all their plates. And they said, this needs to change. Let's start staggering things. So what they did in 71, they came up with this system, which is still in use today. You still have to, those of you who know this, when you go register a plate or you buy a car mid-year, they sequence it so you register your plates by the basis of your last name, okay? A, you renew your plates in February. PQR, renew their plates in September. And this is the letter they originally assigned to those. Now, what they did um, was how do we move into this cycle of getting everybody on that monthly cycle? They issued, if your name was last name A through L, when you went in in January of, of um, 71, they gave you a six month plate, okay? If your name was M through Z, they gave you a plate on that cycle. You got your letter then, okay? So um, Ellis County R got this plate in January of 71. It expired in September, so you got a nine-month plate. And then in September, you went in and bought your 72 plate, and it was a year, and you were in that cycle. But for the people A through L, and this is what's interesting, if your last name started with A, in January 71, you went in and bought a six-month plate. Then in July, you went in and bought a seven-month plate that would expire then in February. And then in February of 72, you went and bought your 72 plate, or 73 plate. You got your 72 in July. So if your name started with A, in the course of 13 months, you bought three plates just to get into that cycle. Okay, and I'm sure people complained, but that's how they got into the staggered month system. So they started putting, you know, when it expired. Expires October of 72. An M expired in August. Okay, that's um, essentially the 73 plate. And then by um, 74, they quit putting that expiration because by now everybody started to know when those letters expired, all right? They put Wheat Centennial on, and supposedly I've heard this is not, they haven't proved that this is the actual centennial year when the Russian immigrants came over and planted red winter wheat, as they say in, oh, 1874, 75. Some people say, well, that's kind of speculation, but we had the Wheat Centennial on kind of running from, I think it was like August to August for two years there, and then they dropped it. You can see, so the H plate has it, and then by summer they've dropped, you know, when the S's uh, came due in fall. 75, another change, and, and maybe some of you remember this, passed a law, state legislature said, we're gonna start requiring front plates again. And here's, um, this one has stickers on the back, plate, but they say, okay, you've got to have a front plate. So for your 76 plates, you got to buy two plates now. Kind of get in line with some of the other states. Vanity plates are starting to be issued for the first time. And you'll notice these stickers. A little more about that. So passed a law, front plates are required. This was in January. By April, here's what happened. Governor Bennett, Robert Bennett was governor, and we're doing budget cuts in the state. He repealed the state's new two license plate law. Been in effect since only January. So for three months, people have bought front plates, A's, B's, and C's, had to pay for, a, I don't know what kind of fee for an extra plate. Governor Bennett repeals the law. He says it costs too much money. We need to do some budget cuts. So anybody from here on out doesn't have to buy a front plate. Now, again, people complain. Well, I had to buy a front plate. And I actually remember a story as a kid, one of my friend's mother 
kept her front plate on for quite a while saying, I paid for that front plate and nobody else did, so by God, I'm going to keep it on the front. So anyway. <laughs> um, so this is interesting and I don't know what happened to him. So the state had already printed up a bunch of front plates and Elton Lobbin, state director of vehicles said, his department had received offers from collectors, recyclers, and even one state senator who'd offered to buy all the extra front plates. I don't know what they ended up doing with them, but anyway. Budget cuts. The other budget cut thing was the cycle of moving to decals. They said, okay, here's another budget cut thing. Let's quit issuing plates every year and we're going to do them every five years. We've since got away from the five-year thing. but. Um, and trucks, I, I, I guess I didn't mention truck tags. Truck tags still stayed on the end of the year cycle. So when we implemented that staggered registration system, trucks were essentially a year behind all the vehicles. So when they implemented the decals, trucks were still on the old green 75 plate and autos were on the blue, blue and white car plate. And they just, rather than printing blue tags for the trucks, I said, ah, we'll just go with the decals. And so you had, all through the late 70s, um, the decals on, for trucks were on the green plate and the uh, decals for the autos were on the, on the blue plates. 1980, we issued a new plate. This was the end of the five years, so we're going to issue new plates every five years. That doesn't last. We'll see. Um, we actually have this blue plate with the golden wheat stalks and the white letters. Um, this is the first time Kansas, and I never knew this organization existed, the Automobile License Plate Collectors Association. There is an association. Kansas won an award, best plate of the year, for this plate. Okay. Um, here's an example. Law enforcement hated it. They said you couldn't read it because of the wheat stocks. It was illegible. So they complained. So, after two years, state legislature says, okay, law enforcement, you win. We'll give you a legible plate. And they issue this. Plain white with blue letters. So we scrapped the award-winning plate, and now we have this with a little sunflower decal up in the corner. All right. So those plates, so both the award-winning wheat ones and the white ones, both were legal. Um, if you already had the wheat ones, you got to keep those and put decals on them. If you got a new plate, you got this one. They all stayed into effect until 88, which they kind of violated our whole five-year new plate rule. So in 88, we went to an alphanumeric system. A lot of people hated this. Right? Because prior to this, if you had a plate like this, you could look at your neighbor's car and go, oh, is that their car? Right? This is somebody from Dickinson County and their last name starts with M. I know who that is. Alpha plate? I don't know who that is. We launched this plate originally. People complained. People really complained because it didn't have the last letter of the surname on and the big county stickers, big county letters. That was the main gripe. But um, Revenue Secretary Ed Rolfe said, okay, we'll improve it. We have these Art Deco letters here. So we improved it. We kind of made them a little more, the font a little easier to read, got rid of the Art Deco, and we enlarged the county sticker by four times because people wanted to know what county are these people from. Okay, so this plate ran up through 93, which we're back kind of on a five-year cycle again. Um, started with AAA 000, then AAA 001. Uh, by about, and this is approximate, DVD 999 is when they changed to this one, DVE 000, through about GRR 999. And then in 94, we issue this plate. Um, Kansas wins their second award for best license plate of the year again with some wheat stocks on it. Numbering starts where we left off with the last, um, with the, what I call the Art Deco lettering ones. 
um, and we continue this up until 2001. 2001, a new design with the Capitol building. And again, lettering starts where we left off. This plate is still valid. I did not realize that because I've seen a few running around on vehicles and I thought, that's an old plate. It's valid. You can actually, you could have put a sticker on this. I did not know that. So now I don't know if you have an old plate, if you can go back in and re-register it, that I don't know. But approximately the last capital plate was XUY 499, approximately. And then in 2007, we issue this. I don't like this plate. I think it's ugly, but anyway, that's my, that's my issue. The state seal. This plate is still what we're using today. 15 years we've used this plate. So you could have had 15 years worth of decals on this plate. We flip the numbering system, we start over. So the prior ones were AAA000, this is 000AAA. And the numbering changes here first, so it would be AAA001, 002, AAA, and so on. Um, about August 2018, the state makes another change, and if you'll notice, all the plates up until this time have been embossed. In other words, they've been stamped. The letters have been stamped in. They shift to essentially a screen printed plate where the numbers aren't embossed. Um, most states had embossed plates because they're tougher to for, you counterfeit, um, but we're now moving to, I guess, they feel like this is still tough to counterfeit. I mean, it's got some digital things in there that you could probably tell, you know, that little, there's this little, almost looks like a DNA spiral up and down in the middle of the plate. And the new plates are not issued to counties in boxes like they used to. You know, it used to be county would have a whole box of plates already printed up. And I know that because back in Dickinson County, I'd go in and get a plate and go, what do you got in the box? What number's coming up next? And I'd go, ah, can you, give me, can you dig down and give me that number? And they would, right? So that probably wasn't officially, you're supposed to do that, but I would. Now, they're just printed on demand and then mailed from the state. So there's no inventory. They moved to, which I teach in supply chain, just in time inventory. There's no you know, printing up of plates and then maybe we printed too many, maybe we didn't. So they are printed on demand as you need them. Um, I don't know how much longer we're gonna keep this plate. You know, like I said, we've had it for 15 years now, since 2007. Um, we'll see, I guess. Vanity plates. So I wanna talk about vanity plates. They started when, back in 76, okay? Beginning of 76. And remember when we went to decals, the trucks were still on the green with white cars were on blue with white so when they issued vanity plates if you had a truck it was green with white letters uh, if you had a car it was blue with white letters and they issued vanity plates front and rear and um, vanity plates up until fairly recently um, you could have a same plate in different counties so Sedgwick County could have this plate Riley County could have this plate. You could have 105 same vanity plates registered with different counties. Do you know what the most common plate name was in Kansas? Well, Jack. No, Huskers. Go, fig go figure, I have no idea why. <laughs> why in the world is, was Huskers the most common vanity plate? Strange as it may seem. So. Who would have thought that? So here's vanity plates. So vanity plates are actually still on the every five year new plate rule. Um, 80 to 85, we had blue on gold. 85 to 90, blue on gold, but was kind of, kind of pattering this same, you know, Art Deco lettering, coloring a little bit, but a um, little different. 90 to 95, kind of this faded gold with a wheat stock. 95, uh, blue over white, Kansas. And then 2000, we had the little sunflowers. 
2005, we had the Buffalo. Again, third time we won, best plate of the year was with the Buffalo. Um, 2010, this is when they went to, um, you can only have one unique combination per state, so no more a bunch of Huskers. Um, there will only be one Huskers plate in, in the state of Kansas now. Um, this one, and I didn't really realize this, I'd never looked that close at them. Um, you've got the old-fashioned windmill and then the new uh, wind generator windmill, but you had a state seal superimposed. I never realized the state seal, I never looked at them that close, I guess, was um, in the background there. And then in uh, 2015, um, Sunflower, and then when we went to embossed, um, same pattern, but that was up through 2020. This is the current with just new wind generators, but this year you can get a personalized plate on the ugly blue state seal plate. I don't know why, but um, I guess if you don't want wind generators on your license plate, you can do that. Vanity plates, um, you can have seven letters, numbers, combinations thereof. Obvious reasons, there are some that you cannot have. You cannot have one bad A55. You cannot have 05 hit. You can kind of use your imagination on some of those. You cannot have 420 weed, murder, 247 kegger and 28,550 more combinations that the state says, no, you can't put that on your plate. Antique plates, and, and I don't know when antique plates were first issued. I know as a kid, I remember seeing this uh, blue and gold, um, and then they went to, and I think I've got a couple, or maybe at least one antique. Yeah, this is an embossed one, blue over white um, antique plate and then they went to the screened here in 2018. You can get, um, and some of you have done this, I know, find a plate from that year that your car is. You've got to check with the um, state or the treasurer's office and see if it's been used. So for example, my MG out here, I have a 64 plate on it, Dickinson County 704. What they check though is if there is a D Dickinson County 704 of any other year, you can't use it. So it's got to be a unique number and they don't care so much about the year. That number has to be the only number. So they check the database and see. So you can do that. Special group plates. So we've started to see a lot um, more of these. This is kind of a way to, um, and I don't know how the funding works all this, but there's an extra fee obviously. Um, and there are a bunch of organizations and groups that have these. There's um, Kansas Agriculture, you've seen, maybe seen the In God We Trust. There's Combat Wounded, Purple Heart. There's like Vietnam Veterans, Regular Veterans, um, State of the Arts, the I Like Ike Plate, City of Wichita Plate, um, various different special interest groups that you can actually get a plate for. And you can also get universities. What I didn't know is these numbers, share, the number scheme shares the same numbers. So there's only one number one plate. KU can't have a number one plate. K-State has the number one. So <laughs> interesting. And that is President, that is actually on President K-State's vehicle. It's a leased vehicle and it stays on who, whoever the president is, whatever vehicle they drive. Dealer tags. So I think I've got an example of a dealer tag over here. They've been issued since I don't know when, a long time. Um, it has a D and then your dealer number. And then they will issue A, B, C, you know, up to 26 plates with Z. And if you need more than 26, they start over with A, 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 B, A, C, so on. Um, dealer numbers. Just kind of FYI, dealer number one is Laird and Oler Ford in Topeka. Um, Murdoch is 113. Shrams was 154. And it used to be that dealers would keep the same number even if they sold the dealership. Um, because 187 used to be, maybe some of you are old enough to remember, quality Oldsmobile Jeep out there at the end of points. They had 187. When Briggs bought them, they kept the 187. Key Pontiac was 515 and then Briggs 
kept the 515 when they bought Key Pontiac and so on. Um, Robbins across the street did not keep Shrams 154 and I think that I think that law has changed. I think you get a new dealer number now. I'm not sure how that works. But anyway, there was a list. I found a list of dealerships and you could look up a dealer and find their number on, online as well. So um, Kansas government plates. This is the old official uh, plate on state vehicles. This is the new one, um, brown on white. Um, Highway Patrol has their own plates. City and county have kind of this plain, same as the antique vehicles, this blue on white, and it'll say city or county, and it's just a plain registration number. So, um, Kansas, like I said, staggers registration. Most other states do, it just depends. Um, Kansas, and I don't know if Kansas is unique in this, in the, our staggered registration, is based on your last name and they will shift you to whenever your last name is. Other states I know you go register it, it's good for a year from whenever you buy it and then you may have multiple vehicles and have different expiration months on them. This here is a um, map of who has screened plates, who has embossed plates. Um, Kansas has moved to a screened plate where it's just printed. Those are in red. Um, green are embossed, yellow is kind of a combination, and Vermont, Vermont is kind of always a radical state, they have debossed plates, which means instead of the numbers being raised, the numbers are recessed. Um, and Vermont's kind of kept that same, if you've ever seen a Vermont plate, white on green, and they've got that rectangle around their numbers, kind of trying to look almost like a European plate a little bit, but um, they're the only state that does debossing. Front and rear versus rear only. Um, yellow states are rear only, which is interesting, mostly in the southeast, plus some in the um, Rust Belt. And then um, front and rear is um, either the purple or the light purple is, they have some exceptions to front and rear. Size of plates. So the US plate is this here in brown, and this kind of compares to other countries. Most commonly, you probably think of European plates. It's this yellow, they're really long and narrow, but there's kind of everything in between. China has this size, Australia has this, Japan has this, Switzerland has this really small plate, and then Monaco has kind of a, a small plate as well. So just kind of comparison of different plates there. So what does the future bring for license plates? Digital. Digital plates are already legal in California, Arizona, Michigan, and Texas. So you have a plate, it's either battery powered, batteries will last up to five years, or it's wired directly into your car's wiring. It will display your number or whatever message needs to be displayed. When registration's up, it displays in big letters, invalid, so you know it's expired. If a vehicle's stolen, you can send a signal that it will appear stolen on your license plate. Renewal's easy. You do it via an app. This is the future. It's coming. Like I said, it's already legal in four states. Fleets have found cost savings and tracking info useful. Now, digital plates can do real-time monitoring, mileage tracking, in a thing called geofencing. This is just like your electronic fence you have for your dog, where it can't go beyond. You can do that with this. So if you have a fleet and you say, I don't want employees to drive outside of this area, you can do it. And you can control where that vehicle goes. So anyway, that's where we're headed. Probably not the near too far in the near future, because like I said, four states already have allowed it. So this is an example of a California plate. And if you look close, you can see, yeah, it's just a digital screen image that's being displayed. So no more printing of plates. Probably will come with the vehicle, is my guess. And you just program it in, whatever state registration, and display whatever you want. So anyway, um, 
Again, I'd like to thank um, the museum, Doug, Eric Artzer, and Larry Shaw as well for putting this all together. Um, lots of um, resources on the web I've used. Um, this wasn't all my um, info by any means. And um, this was really Larry's idea, you know, and it's really dedicated to him. So, any questions? And I'll do my best. Yes. I was told when I was young that the plates were stamped at the penitentiary. Is that true? I believe that is true because I've always heard that too. And I think since they went into screening, that's no longer valid. I've heard that 3M has a contract with several states to do printing and stuff, but yeah. <laughs> Those test plates were printed in the prison. Okay. Yeah, so we, the museum actually got a bunch of, um, these are state plates. But we've got a whole stack of them here that came from the what State Museum, State Historical Museum, in different colors, and they were just running kind of tests to see different colors to see what how they turned out. And we've got a whole stack of various test plates that yeah, we're we're done at the State Penitentiary. All right. <clears throat> Darn good job for not knowing what he was going to be doing here a month or two ago. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Dan. That was awesome. I know Larry would be very proud of the job that you did, and we are for as well.